Hello and welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. If you heard episode 212, something deeply personal, where I talk about the ending of my marriage, then you'll know that this episode is especially relevant to my own life right now. In so many ways, this experience of ending my marriage, while painful, has also illuminated so much more about relationships, so much of which I'm really excited to share with you. And at the same time, I also really have no choice but to be with what is, what is actually happening in my life. And since we decided to end our marriage back in September, it's been a journey. A deep, profound, paradoxical, sometimes confusing journey that has brought its own share of gifts and realizations, along with some painful moments and some joyful moments. So I want to share some of that with you now, because whether you're going through a breakup in this moment or have been through a breakup in the past and still maybe have some cleanup work to do, or maybe you'll be going through a breakup at some point in the future. I mean, that just about covers all of us, right? I mean, I think most of us probably fall into one of those or more than one of those categories. Um, So anyway, this episode is for you. Before we dive in, I just want to remind you that I do have a free guide to my top three relationship communication secrets. These are the kinds of things that you can put into practice, whether your relationship is beginning, in the middle, or ending, and they will help you stay grounded and connected as much as possible, no matter how challenging the thing that you're talking about. Um, It may not be perfect, but at least you can say that you did your best. If you are interested in downloading this free guide, just visit neilsatin.com slash relate, or you can text the word relate to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. Also, I really want to thank you for supporting the mission of Relationship Alive. This podcast is my offering to you so that you can have the best possible relationships. And if you're finding the show to be helpful, please consider a donation. Every little bit counts. Anything that you feel comfortable with is awesome. So to choose something that feels right to you, just visit neilsatin.com slash support or text the word support to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. And this week I'd like to thank Marie, Timothy, Rona, Karina, Angie, Sylvia, David, Heather, Alicia, Drew, and Lydia. Thank you all so much for your contributions to Relationship Alive. And just a reminder that we do have a free Facebook group, the Relationship Alive community on Facebook. And if you have questions for me, please email them to questions at relationshipalive.com. And the best thing you could possibly do is to record yourself asking the question. And I'll keep your name out of it, but it would be really good, I think, for people to hear your question in your voice, and I'll respond. Uh, Okay, I think that's it. Let's get on with this question of how do you heal after a breakup? Is there a right way to do it? Is there a wrong way to do it? Uh, My goal here is to be able to help give you um, some strategies, any of which could work for you. One thing that's become really clear to me is that we are all on our own healing journey. So what works for me might be appropriate for you, or it might not. Also, breaking up, no matter how you look at it, is a trauma. No matter what side of the breakup you're on, Maybe it was mutual, maybe you're the breakupper, <laughs> maybe you're the breakupy. No matter where you come down, 
it's almost impossible to leave a relationship unscathed. There's almost always going to be something that you're going to be grieving or dealing with. Now, that doesn't mean that it is required for it to be some big, dramatic thing. You do have some power to choose the experience that you want to have. Um, so by all means, if you see yourself contributing to making your the ending of a relationship into some big dramatic thing, then you might want to stop. You might want to stop and ask yourself if that is really helping you or serving you or helping the situation. Uh, because ultimately, I think what we want to do is get to a place of healing and wholeness. And so what's probably most important when you're breaking up or going through that process is for you to hold on to you in the process, to hold on to yourself because you're untethering from that other person. So just keep in mind that the process is about finding your own footing, your own heart space and headspace that's not in reference to that other person. Um, and that can be part of what's so painful about the process, the absence of that other person, the external reference point that we get so used to having when we're in a relationship. But when you create a lot of big drama or charge or negative energy around the ending of a relationship, then you're actually feeding the energy with that other person. And I don't think that's what you want to be doing in the, when it comes right down to it. When it comes to that question of how you stand in an empowered place when it's all said and done, um, I think holding on to what's positive, what's you're gaining, what you're gaining, how you grew is key um, versus holding on to any negative stories that you have. So yeah, what, what are your stories about what happened? Are your stories empowering you? Um, is it empowering you at the expense of the other person? Because your story and your partner's story may not agree with each other ever. They probably don't agree with each other because we never get to that point of breaking up or typically we don't get there from a place of complete agreement. We see the world in different ways and that's what leads us to feel like it's untenable to stay together. So in the end, what your partner thinks really doesn't matter. But it is helpful to at least do your best to get perspective on what their story is because then you can mine their story for whatever might actually be true about it. It's really helpful to not just discount everything they're saying in their own pain or from their own vantage point out of hand. You don't want to just dismiss it. You want to, if you can, just listen and see, ask yourself, what is it about what they're saying that might be true? And can you take that on as part of the pathway to your own healing? Some of it might be completely true. Some of it might be partly true. Some of it you might try on as true and you might wear that for a little while only to discover that it wasn't true. So all of that is acceptable. And in the end, it's great if your partner can come along for a part of that ride and can see the places where they're holding things about you that aren't necessarily true. But those times when that's going to happen, those are probably more the exception than the rule. What's more likely is that you're going to end up in your separate places with your separate viewpoints and you're not going to be able to influence each other that much because you are broken up. 
So that's just part of the reality that we have to come to face. We couldn't control each other when we were in relationship. We definitely can't control or control each other now that we are out of a relationship. Now, if your story doesn't include you taking responsibility for your part in whatever happened and the dynamic that got created, then I can tell you right now that your story is incomplete. Now, this doesn't mean that everything that happened was your fault. That's not what I'm saying at all. But, and this is core to the, the conscious uncoupling process. It's a process that's all about reclaiming your power and mining your experience for the growth and transformation. And that only happens if you're able to look at what happened and figure out how you contributed Sometimes we figure out that there were things that we were tolerating that we shouldn't have tolerated. There were questions that we were holding inside that we never got the answer to. There were intuitions that we had that we weren't willing to trust or believe. Um, there were judgments that we held about the other person that may or may not have been true or about ourselves that may or may not have been true. There, there may be ways that we were letting our shame run the show. I'm going to summarize this all in a little bit, but the goal here is for you to do a deep dive and examine what happened, try to make sense of it and try to own it as much as you can. Cause no one, well, almost no one leaves a relationship because it's going really well for them. Um, that would be interesting if we did that, if we got to a place where we were like, this is amazing. This is going so well. Let's end it right now. Let's quit while we're ahead. Um, so really it shouldn't be a newsflash that the ending of a relationship usually involves something painful happening. And, um, you know, unless you're in one of those unique situations where someone just leaves you kind of out of the blue, um, which can happen. It can happen intentionally, like, um, you know, someone just decides they don't want to be in the relationship anymore and they jet. Or it can happen unintentionally, like, for instance, if your partner happens to pass away. Um, in those situations, sometimes the pain that you experience might be mostly after the fact. So it might not be that the relationship itself was all that painful. But on the other hand, in some relationships, there can be so much pain that's happening during the relationship that it actually forces you to do a fair amount of growth and healing while you're still in the relationship so that you're, so that you can even contend with the challenge and the pain that you find yourself in. So in those situations, you might get out of the relationship and find yourself feeling mostly relief that you're just not in it anymore. Um, but that doesn't mean that grief won't find you down the road. So like as an example, I think last week I told you that I had been, or a few couple weeks ago, I told you that I'd been feeling lately actually pretty good. Like, you know, I had some deep dives into grief um, but for the most part, I was feeling really hopeful and optimistic. And that was where, that's the place that I've been inhabiting. Well, just last night, I went to go dance. And um, I was really excited to just have some space to move and play with other people and, um, and just experience the journey of um, dancing for a couple hours. And uh, as it turned out... Um, I walked into the space and I had this sense of the deep importance of this space where I actually rarely dance. But the very first time that I danced as an adult in this whole kind of conscious dance sort of way, the very first time was in that space. And so that made it powerful to be there. And then I realized that the last time I had danced in that space was um, a big New Year's dance that 
I had taken part in organizing and uh, and it was for it was a benefit for a friend of mine who um, had been diagnosed with cancer and um, we were trying to rally and just help this person um, cover their costs and help out in whatever way we could and um, so that was a powerful experience in and of itself and then um, this friend was there dancing that uh, last night. So that was also really powerful just to realize my gratitude for that person being there. So I was feeling all these feelings. And then I realized that the person who was DJing and facilitating the dance, that the last time I had danced to their music was at my wedding. And that hit me really hard. So I spent probably the first, I don't know how long it was, probably 20 minutes, half an hour, just lying on the floor and crying and really just feeling that deep, deep feeling of remembering something beauty beautiful, remembering a beautiful moment and, uh, and allowing myself to feel, to feel how I felt, which is... I think such an important part of the grieving process is to allow yourself to have the feelings that you're feeling and to let them move through you. Now, at the very beginning of this episode, I asked rhetorically if there were a wrong way to go through this process. And I happen to think that there is a wrong way. I think the wrong way would be Wasting the opportunity to get really, really clear with yourself on what happened. The wrong way would be missing out on the chance to grow from the experience. Would be missing out on the chance to grow so that you don't repeat whatever mistakes you might have made yet again. This isn't to say that your future relationships won't have any mistakes or that they're going to be perfect, but at least let's make different kinds of mistakes, right? So that's what can be so challenging about like simply entering into a rebound relationship, for instance, because the odds are slim that you'll have done the work, plus the odds favor that you'll choose someone who's simply a reaction to the last relationship you were in. And no matter what, you'll still have some grieving to do, even if you're in that new relationship. So... What are the main goals of healing after a breakup? I'm going to just name some of them. The first one is probably to get into a relationship with a part of you that's feeling pain, that's feeling grief, the parts of you that are hurting, so that you can deepen your ability to take care of yourself when you're in pain. So you can learn to show up for you when you're in pain. And the, the huge gift of learning that is that then you're able to show up for other people so much more effectively when they're in pain. The second thing that is really important when you're healing after a breakup is um, to look really closely at who you were in the relationship so that you can reclaim those pieces, those places where you gave away your power to the other person or to the situation. What is the way that you were in the relationship? What does that reveal to you about your core beliefs about yourself? What are the stories that you're making the end of that relationship mean about you or about the other person or how you're going to interact with the world? These are all really important clues to the inner workings that are governing how you interact with the world and how you create your relationships. So it's a really important part of the process to get in touch with who you were and what that, what that says about how you operate in the world, what you believe to be true about yourself. And once you unearth those core beliefs, particularly the unhealthy ones, things like I'm not worthy of love or I'm not important or I'm not special or I can't trust myself or I'm always going to be alone. And healing those things, that's 
a huge part of going through the process of healing from a breakup. And that work is really at the heart of um, Catherine Woodward Thomas's conscious uncoupling work, um, which you might recall I talked with her actually specifically about that in episode 96. So you can scroll through and find episode 96 or you can visit neilsatin.com slash kwt3. Uh, I think that's because it was the third episode that I did with Catherine um, to hear her talking about finding those unhealthy core beliefs and healing them. It's such a powerful practice, especially to reorient you as you re-enter the world of dating and relationships so that you don't repeat the same patterns in how you choose the people that you're going to be with. Another important piece of the work that we do in healing from a breakup is to find those places where we held shame or fear. This is something I was mentioning earlier. Um, And where you held yourself back in the relationship. And to do the work that allows you to own those parts of yourself. Um, Because if they were hidden, then they had a power over you. And if they're still hidden, they will continue to have a power over you and they'll undermine your future relationships as well. So a huge goal is to find those places and to do the work required to heal them. So another important goal of being, of healing after a breakup is to develop a deep relationship with who you are outside of the context of being in a relationship. And often this requires a certain amount of space for yourself. Now this level of presence and inner knowing allows you to reestablish your own inner detector, your inner barometer for understanding how the world and how the other people in the world are impacting you. I, it's really important to me to emphasize just how much you are being impacted by your partner when you're in a relationship. So taking this opportunity to get to know yourself and to understand how the world makes you and you alone feel is so helpful, uh, not only in how you improve the way that you are in the world and getting to know what is right for you and what isn't so right for you, um, but it also will help you tune into the impact that other people, potential new partners are having on you. Um, And to be honest with yourself about that impact so that, um, or honest with them about that impact as well. Um, That really brings you into deep presence and courageous vulnerability with other people, which are the makings of a powerful connection. The other reason to know yourself really well is so that as you proceed in life, you'll recognize it when important feelings bubble up that demand your attention. Um, And in particular, your grief. The beauty of grief is that you really don't have to do anything other than allow yourself to have the feelings and let them move through you. And as I was describing before, sometimes those new moments of grief will arrive out of the blue and they're just a gift to you to create a deeper sense of wholeness within yourself, to heal the places where that sadness is stuck within you. And if you're not aware of those moments when they happen, then you might be tempted to just simply ignore what's going on or gloss over it or look the other way, but, or do something to distract yourself. But when they're present and you dive deep, deep, it actually gives you a chance to rework that part of you that's hurting into an even stronger integrated part of you. Another important part of the process are any sort of completions that still need to have with your former partner. And sometimes those can happen with them 
at least on some level. But there will always be completions that you need to have within yourself as you make sense of what happened and come to that deeper understanding within yourself of what happened and of what you're leaving behind. So it's not required that you do that with your partner. Uh, In fact, um, often a coach can lead you through the process of meeting with your partner in the energetic field um, in your mind and um, saying the things that you need to say and um, having uh, having a real healing and completing, completing moment with them. Uh, in Conscious Uncoupling, Catherine uh, Woodward Thomas also talks about the importance of creating and holding a vision of what you think is possible for you and your former partner separate from being a couple. Um, not everyone does this. I think it's really important. So it's something that I choose to do. Um, and to hold on to that vision of, uh, of a positive outcome despite the pain and challenge that leads you to separating from each other. Now, this one is especially for those of you who are the break-upper. If you broke up with someone, uh, maybe they weren't expecting it or maybe they didn't want it. So any sort of guilt that you have for leaving a person behind, for making that choice... Um, you're going to need to do whatever is required to um, move past your feelings of guilt. That might involve making amends. That might involve an apology. uh, It might involve ways of sort of paying it forward. Or it might just involve really getting to know the parts of you that were hurting and unsatisfied in the relationship and to learn how to give yourself the benefit of the doubt that you were doing the best you could and you did what you ultimately felt was right. The last thing I'll mention is that another important part of healing after a breakup is also helping the people around you, your family, your community, helping them come to understand what happened and how to best support you and doing it in a way that honors everyone involved. So that last one is probably big enough to warrant its own episode, so I'll probably talk about that one separately. Um, Meanwhile, I do need to take a quick break to talk about this week's sponsors, and then afterwards, I'm going to go through a few specific myths, mistakes, and strategies to help you on the healing journey. It's not going to be a comprehensive list, but I'll point you in the right direction in a number of ways around some of the major questions that people have about healing after a breakup. Okay, so our first sponsor for today is Venus A. Fleur. They design customizable arrangements filled with real roses that last a year that make the perfect gift for birthdays, Valentine's Day, or just because. They're super long lasting, so they're a reminder of your love and thoughtfulness long past the day you gave them. We received a beautiful arrangement of 16 red roses, which I gave to my daughter as a belated birthday present, and she loved them. It's hard to explain exactly, but these arrangements do seem extra luxurious. And while I went for the red roses, they have all sorts of different colors available to make exactly the statement that you want to make. Honestly, I thought about getting the black roses because those look super cool. So whether it's a special occasion to celebrate someone or something you're just buying for yourself as a gift of self-love, visit venusafleur.com slash alive and enter the promo code alive for complimentary shipping. That's venusafleur.com slash alive, and you spell that out V-E-N-U-S-E-T. It's like the French word for and. And then fleur is spelled F-L-E-U-R. So venusafleur.com slash alive, and enter the promo code alive for complimentary shipping in the U.S. through February 29th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time. Our second sponsor 
has been an ongoing sponsor of the podcast. I'm really grateful for their support. They have a special offer for you to help you get exactly the kind of support that you need as you're creating that web of support for yourself that we so often talk about on the show. And it can be so crucial when you are going through a breakup. So one way that allows you to connect with a professional counselor in an online environment that's safe and private is today's sponsor, BetterHelp. With BetterHelp, you can get help on your own time and at your own pace. Along with scheduling video or phone sessions, you can also chat and text with your therapist. They're affordable and financial aid is available for those who qualify. So whether it's anxiety, depression, your relationship, your breakup, grief, stress, trauma, or simply figuring out what you want to work on and working on it, whatever it is, definitely consider BetterHelp as a way to help you transform the places where you're stuck. And best of all, it is a truly affordable option because as a Relationship Alive listener, you get 10% off your first month with discount code ALIVE. So why not get started today? Go to betterhelp.com slash alive, fill out their questionnaire to help them assess your needs and to get matched with a counselor you will love. That's betterhelp.com slash alive. And thank you, BetterHelp and Vina Seyfler for your support of the Relationship Alive podcast and our mission. Okay, so let us dive into a few big questions that people often ask about breaking up. So one of the big ones that people often talk about right at the beginning is whether or not you should see other people when you're going through a breakup. Because after all, I was talking about all of, the, all of the importance of getting to know yourself and not being in relationship and maybe not having a rebound relationship. So what does that mean about whether you should be solo for your healing or actually heal in connection with other people? Now, I want you to know that I don't have any judgment about what you decide is right for you when it comes to this. And I suggest that you don't judge yourself or your partner for whatever choice that you or they are making about this. Um, there are lots of good reasons to find comfort in the arms of another person. For one thing, it feels really good. And for another thing, it's likely that if there were challenges in your relationship, um, that you could feel some areas where you have a lot of deprivation and where you want to experience some bounty. And fortunately, we live in a world that allows us to fairly easily connect with other people. So that question of how to date and how to connect with other people, that's probably a matter for another podcast. But I do want to emphasize, though, that creating space for you and you alone is important to the process. So I would say strive for moderation and balance and in knowing yourself enough to know what feels right. Some things are only possible to heal on your own and other things are only possible to heal in relationship with another person. In fact, you may find that there are aspects of your grief that you don't even feel until you're bouncing up against another person. And I didn't necessarily mean that literally, but that could be literal. And, um, and there's something that happens that unearths um, some more healing that needs to happen within you. So there's valuable stuff for you in interacting with other people. And uh, I encourage you to feel it out and see what feels right for you and don't judge yourself for it. Now, I did say that not taking on the healing and, and dealing that's part of a breakup could be the wrong way to go about it. Um, but then there are people 
that sometimes take it too far in the other direction where they allow themselves to just be completely consumed in an unending uh, amount of grief and anguish. And um, I do encourage you to carve out space for yourself so that you are able to take it on, but to pay attention to when it's becoming too much. And again, only you will know when that is. When Chloe and I first had our unmarrying ritual that we had, I had a solid week where I barely got out of bed. I barely ate. I cried a lot. And I reached out to my friends um, at times, just needing help, needing to cry, needing to process. Um, there is nothing wrong with going to that dark place. Um, and when you do, it's good to know who your friends are so that you can call upon them. And um, part of that is so that they can listen to you. And another part of that is so that they can remind you that it's all going to be okay. And I guess let me take this opportunity to remind you too that it's all going to be okay. Um, if you are in pain right now, it will all be okay. You will get through this and you can handle this. And that's an important part of connecting with other people on the other side of a breakup. But, so, so I give you permission to descend into the depths of your grief, especially initially and, and especially when it comes on. And to also be in touch with the parts of you that at some point might just say, hey, you know what? This is enough for now. It's time to get out of bed. It's time to eat that meal. It's time to shower. It's time to um, get out into the world and take a walk. It's time to go back to work. All of those things. Um, listen to that voice as well because that's a part within us that wants to care for us and see us be whole and, and, and not lose ourselves in our grief. Um, it's really a good idea to get help dealing with the trauma of a breakup. So it's a good time to work with a coach or a therapist to get support. And uh, if you work with a coach, someone who's... Um, experienced with conscious uncoupling. Um, I went through that coach training program. Um, there are lots of other people now who have been certified in the conscious uncoupling coach uh, coaching process. Um, it's a valuable resource to have people who are skilled in helping you deal with a breakup. Um, it's it's uh, often really crucial to get help and support and by going to a professional, then you don't overly burden your friends and family with your grieving process. So we don't wanna, we wanna show up for them and give them that opportunity to be there for us. And like, let's be conscious of also being as resourced as we can be. One thing I want to caution you about, and this, this goes along to, with something that I was talking about in the beginning around, um, finding the places where you can take responsibility for what happened in the relationship. Um, I think it's helpful for you to, um, and for me, for all of us, to not be disparaging about the other person, to not go into a mode of blaming the other person or being a victim. I don't think that's helpful for so many reasons. One, because um, it imparts this real negative charge on the situation and actually feeds energy into your connection to that other person in a way that makes it even more painful, I think, to break up with them. And it makes it harder for you to find the places where you can be empowered and 
I also think that it's um, unhelpful when you're trying to help other people figure out how to hold the two of you. If you're trying to get them to align with you over the other person, then you're putting other people in your life in a really tough position. Um, I said I wasn't really going to get into this too much, but I think it's important to inform the people that are around you that um, that the other person is worthy of compassion and love and that you are worthy of compassion and love. And hopefully um, you're in a place where you can see that and feel that um, because I think that ultimately that leads to the best possible outcomes that we can hopefully trust that the other person is on their healing journey. They're on the journey that they need to be on. And um, by getting people to view them in a negative light, you're not, you're not actually helping them at all. And by holding on to your victimhood, um, you're not helping yourself. Now, that being said, I'm not saying you should be in denial about the ways that their actions may have hurt you. Like it's worth acknowledging that acknowledging the very real things that may have happened in your relationships that were hurtful and that maybe you tolerated and shouldn't have. Um, and maybe it was challenging to figure out how to get out. And like all of that can be true. Um, so sometimes it's worth it to really get to know those things as a way of hitting, I've mentioned this term before, hitting the escape velocity so that you can actually make your exit. It, it can be good to make your list of like all the ways that that person hurt you. But time and again, I've seen that making the other person into an enemy uh, only does both of you a disservice because in the end you chose that person and for s you chose that person because on some level there was something good there was something good about your connection with them there was something good about your relationship there was something positive there and you're only um, going to make it more confusing to yourself if you turn that if you vilify that person and turn them into a, a caricature of the complete person that I know most of us humans to be. Some people out there are truly evil and maybe you were unfortunate enough to end up with one of those people. If so, I'm very sorry. And I take all of this back, just blame them as much as you want. But for the most part, um, let's find those ways that we can just take ownership and send the other person on their way with a blessing instead of a curse. To that end, I think it's helpful to not take things personally that your ex may or may not be doing to the extent that you can just let it go and focus on staying in your lane, as they say, um, it's going to make, make it a lot easier for you. Um, as I mentioned before, you couldn't control them when you're in a relationship. That's like one of the big illusions of relationship is that we can control our partners. You're definitely not going to be able to when you're not in the relationship. And the odds are that they are doing the best that they can. Now, some people when they're in pain will react and they'll do harsh things. And maybe you've done harsh things. Maybe you have intentionally done things to cause harm and inflict pain on your partner and they may be doing that to you but again I would do my best not to take that personally to just see that as a reflection of that is my ex's pain talking that is their pain that is their judgment that's their hurt it's not about me and I'm gonna just let them go through whatever process they need to go through um so there may be a time for you to share your story, um, to share it far and wide. I encourage you to do it after you've had a chance to really develop a more balanced, generous perspective. 
Now, this is just me. Like, I like to hold on to this idea that we're all inherently good people just trying our best. And sometimes when we try our best, we fail miserably. That's just the reality. Um, I want you to get to a place where we're, whenever you are talking about your pain, you can talk about how you got through the pain and are now empowered um, without the need to throw someone else under the bus because that journey to empowerment is your journey and it's about you and deep down the way that we get there if it's because we came through a breakup we have to have some gratitude for that other person for all the misery and pain and challenge that they caused us if it's given us this gift of growth of never doing that sort of thing again or never being with a person like that again whatever it is it's a gift it's a gift that they gave us and uh, as long as we're still here alive to tell the tale then there's still hope for us to experience something better in the future i am an incurable optimist that's just where i land and it's how i try to hold all of my past partners um I try to hold them all in a place where I really just have appreciation and gratitude for them. If there are things that they do that are really destructive, you know, what goes around comes around. Karma will definitely do its work. Um, so, yeah, in the end, like, don't stay tied to that person through creating negative stories. Find ways to encourage others to support you in your growth and your healing without making someone else look bad. Um, because in the end, you might have to remember that your story about that other person might not actually be true. It's just your perspective. It's just your story. So it's best for you to wait until your perspective, your story is balanced so that you don't, in the end, end up causing any undue harm to the other person, to your community, the people who are trying to hold you both in love, or to yourself. Because I think when we do or say negative things about other people, we're just um, you know, causing harm in the end to ourselves as well. So how much space do you want to have from the other person when you break up? Generally, I think that space is actually a good idea. Um, but it's up to you to decide how rigid you want to be or, or you need to be about that. Um, and sometimes when there are children involved, there's only so much space that's actually practical for you to have. Um, so if you're able to be around your partner um, and to ha have conversations that get you to a better place, a place of deeper healing and um, understanding and compassion, then great. But if those conversations just deteriorate or go poorly, then um, you could try getting support and having those conversations with your ex. Or you could just simply stop having them until each of you has a chance to process a little bit more on your own and for things to feel a little bit less raw. And then... After that, maybe you can come back to the table to have a conversation um, if it still feels important to you in the future. Once you've gone through your healing and um, fully separating from the other person and there's not a huge emotional charge, you may find that those conversations that you wanted to have are no longer important. Or you may find that that conversation wasn't important, but there's a new conversation that you want to have and you'll be able to do it in a way that's a lot more um, generative than, you know, trying to rehash old stuff. So those are some thoughts on some of the major aspects of healing after a breakup. Of course, there's more to say. Um, people have written whole books on this topic. Um, and maybe you have specific questions. So as I mentioned before, send your questions or better yet, record your questions. Uh, just use, you know, the voice memo app on your phone or whatever and send 
your question to questions at relationshipalive.com. In the meantime, I'm looking forward to being with you next week where we will be talking about sacred indigenous wisdom to help you in your life and in your relationships. We're going to have with us Shari Mitchell, who is the author of Sacred Instructions, Indigenous Wisdom for Living Spirit-Based Change. It's a really powerful book, and our conversation with Sherry is also going to be super powerful and, uh, and helpful. I think you'll love it. Um, until then, take care. Go easy on yourself. Go easy on everyone else. And um, it's all going to be okay. You can handle this. You'll get through it. Thanks so much for... Thank you.